challenging because I want to try to explain to you this view of economics that I've developed by studying the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas um, that has allowed me to really rethink kind of the foundations of economics. It's a little bit, it's a lot to explain in 45 minutes in a way that's at least somewhat accessible and hopefully somewhat entertaining. Uh, so over the last few years when I've been asked to give these sorts of talks, I've picked slices of it and kind of drilled down deep on my slice. And uh, what I decided to do this time is go back to the very first talk I ever gave on it, which kind of gives a sketch of the overall picture. So this is more of an impressionistic watercolor kind of version of what I'm doing. The idea is to kind of get you to see the shape of what would be involved in, in what I'm trying to do. Um, so, and it's just delightful to be here. I, I've enjoyed my visit. Um, my, my brother's wife's mother <laughs> happens to live in Worcester, and she took me out to a lovely dinner tonight with some fellow Worcesterians. Was, was yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. Ever since the emergence of capitalism, moral questions about economic life have abounded. Um, on the one hand, uh, uh, naysayers will look out and they say, oh, there's lots of economic injustice, it's poisoning the environment, we're becoming rapacious, greedy buzzards. Um, on the other hand, economists might reply and say, no, wait a minute, those same markets uh, have generated an unprecedented level of prosperity for the masses. Billions of people have been lifted out of poverty. This is surely a blessing and a boom to us. Um, and then on the third hand, somebody can go back and say, well, okay, um, but don't we need to worry about the fact that we get all this prosperity by basically inviting people to be greedy buzzards, uh, and even if that generates good outcomes, isn't there something wrong with the soul of capitalism? And it goes on and on. Um, now, as I've already indicated, I'm an economist turned theologian. This actually was written into my DNA. When I was seven or eight uh, for Christmas, I wrote down to Santa, dear Santa, I really, 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 really want a monopoly set. <laughs> and I would like the Child's Illustrated Bible. So, um, I think at the end of the day, the common thread was they both had pretty colors in them. But anyway, um, I've always actually been interested in mammon, God, or mammon. So um, it's natural that uh, the question about how do you bring moral language and integrate that with the insights that economics really properly has um, is there any good way to do that? Now, lots and lots and lots of people try to do this. Um, most people taking up the question, they go at it directly. So they'll say, what should, you know, should we have a minimum wage? Should we worry about the 1%? What, what are the theological teachings about you know, special options for the poor? They go right to the economic issues. Um, I've always found such discussions frustrating because they're fractured. We have one way of thinking about morality and another way of thinking about economics. There's not a good way of bringing the two into conversation, and so there are endless polarized debates. The left argues that we should constrain the market to be just and moral. The right retorts that doing so would hamper economic growth that has done so much good for so many, and we just don't know what to do with that. It just goes back and forth. So my response to this frustration has been to dig down to the foundations. And that's what makes this talk a little bit challenging. Because um, I'm asking us to dig under those questions. I'm not going to talk about just wages. I don't, I'm not that I don't care. Um, what I want to do is to drill down and say, how do we see the world? How do we understand human beings? How do we understand human happiness? And can we use that framework, that foundational framework, to think about these questions? And the essence of my argument is that the assumptions that moderns make and they do make them, they, they don't know that they are, but they're making strong metaphysical assumptions about the human person and the world we live in. But those foundations necessarily fragment our discourse. That's why we can't talk about it in a coherent way. Um, but in my, my argument is that if you go back to classic theological thought as expressed by Aquinas, uh, you'll find a framework that actually can allow us to talk intelligibly, both about markets and morality, in a way that's coherent, at least from where I sit really coherent. So, okay. Um, now the claim that a medieval theologian such as Aquinas can, and if you guys know who Aquinas is, 13th century, really old, really dead, um, long before capitalism got up and started running. Um, the claim that he can be useful in thinking through the perplexities of modern capitalism might seem counterintuitive, and in some sense it is counterintuitive. I'm not going to use Thomas to argue for specific policy prescriptions that would serve as some sort of magic bullet for our current problems. Uh, he wrote in a pre-capitalist world, 
Uh, so most of the specific teachings on economics about usury or just prices don't, they resist easy translation. It's very hard to bring that to bear in a coherent way. What he does do is offer us a view about the function of economic life in a human life oriented towards happiness that's coherent and that I think allows us to say some interesting things. So very briefly, um, a lot of people object at this point. Like, why Thomas? Why? Why Thomas? Um, and behind that question is the one about, is he medieval? <laughs> what can he say about taxes? But the, but the other one is, uh, is he theological? And why would you instead talk about an Aristotle? Thomas draws on Aristotle a lot, and Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, does not make strong, explicit faith commitments. Right? So wouldn't it be more uh, accessible? So my answer to this is a personal biography. Uh, I'm a Catholic a moral theologian. It's natural to take up Thomas as a resource for a project like this. Um, his thought actually animates Catholic social thought. He's very important to the church in terms of how they see things, so he's a natural place to go. But more importantly, having taken up Thomas, I found that he resonated with my sensibilities as an economist. Thomas does not villainize self-interest. He does not see private property as just a concession made to our fallen nature. He actually approves of private property. He respects human finitude in a way that's congruent with the best economic insights into the value of markets. And also, he's just a really smart guy, so who wouldn't want to hang out? Okay, um, those resonances offer Thomas, or my framework building out of Thomas, I think a critical purchase on modern uh, market system. Uh, it, it provides a way of saying, here's what's good, here's what's really valuable, but also here's how we can understand why we feel uneasy about it, where do the critiques come from. Okay, uh, quick caveat. There's a lot to say on this topic, um, and one, the one I'm going to take tonight is to say, here's what economic life could look like if we were as we should be. So it's an ideal picture of how humans should pre approach happiness and what an economic life in service of that project would look like. We obviously do not live in a world where people act the way I'm going to describe them as acting. Okay, and I am aware of that. Uh, if I had another hour of your time, I could give you a second lecture about how Aquinas also understands how humans actually are and how he brings that into conversation. But the reason why I want to detain you with what will sound like a little bit of a utopian picture of economic life is because I think that we need to have in our minds a clear idea about what the ideal would look like so we can think intelligently about how to navigate the world we actually have. Um, in the wake of Machiavelli, the modern world turned towards being pragmatic, that's describe people as they are, and in losing sight of the ideals, I think it, it makes it harder for us to find our way intelligently towards, towards good policy choices. Okay. Uh, and if you want during the Q&A, we can talk about, okay, people don't act that way, what are we going to do now? So, and I'll, I'll tell you, so. Okay. All right. Uh, in order to do this, uh, depending on time, um, I'm going to pick three topics to illustrate uh, how, what thinking about economics through Aquinas' lens would look like. One would be on the nature of human desire, our demand for goods and services. Um, one would be on his conception of private property, which is the first one that captured my heart get all excited. Um, and the third, if there's time for me, would be about uh, what role the money prices in the financial system in general. How does that fit into our view of economic life? Um, I am going to drop that if I don't have time, so we'll see. But in order to do this, I have to give you some sense of those foundations I talked about. We have to drill down. So you're going to get kind of a weird abstract talk for about 20 minutes here. The good news, though, is two principles, so that's not so hard, right? Two things that um, I think are really important to distinguish Aquinas' approach to thinking about economics. Number one, we need to think about uh, our activities as ordered to an end. Completely innocuous claim. When you get up out of bed, you have a purpose. You have something that you're trying to do. Um, so the technical word drawn from Aristotle would be that we have a telos, or goal. Um, and that the best way to think about economic life is in light of that goal, telos. The second key principle or foundational uh, thing that matters, and this is where we get theological, is that it helps to think about creation uh, as an analogical reflection of God. So this is hardcore theology, but it turns out it matters for how we think about ordinary things like buying for the milk of the market. Okay. So first of all, the view of life as ordered or teleological. 
Okay, in the modern world, we tend to think of human life as being divided into various spheres or roles. We enter into the labor force as workers and into the marketplace as consumers. We go home to our families as husbands or wives, parents or children. We interact socially with friends, we worship as fellow believers. Each of these spheres has their own logic, and we struggle to integrate our various roles into a coherent role, whole. In the course of our various activities, we pursue diverse goods. Material wealth, sustenance, pleasure, health, love, friendship, good works, community, faith, and so on. What we lack is a way of ordering those diverse goods, and this can lead to tensions. One of the tensions most salient to my discussion uh, is the tension we might feel between pursuing virtue, trying to develop ourselves as good, excellent human beings, and pursuing material well-being. Now, most of us would like to think of ourselves as good people. Uh, yet, it sometimes seems that being good can be a disadvantage when it comes to pursuing material wealth. A young lawyer might want to provide legal services to the poor, but feel like he cannot bypass an opportunity to earn a substantially higher salary by working for a corporation. A manufacturer might want to produce goods of the highest quality, but feel like he has to produce shoddier goods if doing so is the way to maximize profits. Richard Rich and a man for all seasons might know deep down that he has a calling to be a teacher, but feel compelled to pursue wealth and position at court at the expense of his own personal integrity. In such cases, we might trade off wealth for virtue or virtue for wealth, but however it goes, we have a feeling that there's a tension between the two goals. Now, on a Thomistic account, uh, those sorts of tensions just don't exist. Um, beginning with Thomas's the aspect of Thomas's thought that does draw on Aristotle, you can observe that for Thomas, human life is ordered towards happiness. Um, but he understands happiness, the true happiness that can really fulfill us, as being not about what we have, but what we are. Uh, in uh, Centesimus Honest, John Paul II says, when we think about progress, we should think about progress in being, not progress in having. Now, and I spend all my time with my students trying to talk about this, um, but I think deep down we actually know that trying to, trying to grow in human excellence really is the source of a lasting happiness in a way that trying to strive for a bigger house is not. Um, you can see it, I, I don't know if they still run the ad, be all you can be, like that kind of an idea. Um, but the idea of, human, of, of pursuing virtue is that you want to be as fully human as possible. Um, the distinctive characteristic of human beings is that we are rational animals. And as rational animals exercising our powers, we should be capable, and if you've met people like this, and I, by the way, you can look at me tell I'm not one, um, we should be capable of learning to desire what is appropriate for us to desire, using reason to deter, determine what goods really are worth pursuing, rather than feeling like we have to follow along some impulse. Um, we're able to have mastery over excessive fear or excessive risk taking. We are able to treat others with justice and to use our practical reason and prudence to judge what is best to be done in any given situation. So virtue is the excellence of the person who can thoroughly enjoy food without succumbing to gluttony, the person who knows when to charge up the hill and when to order retreat, the person who readily accords to others what is due, the person who can determine how best to manifest that human virtue in particular, in the particularities of his or her circumstances. Um, okay. Insofar as the core of human happiness lies in the exercise of human excellence, there is a lesson sense that life can be compartmentalized across spheres. It is true that our various social roles will place different demands on us, but those various roles are integrated in their common concern that we exercise our virtue, carrying out those roles in a humanly excellent way. Virtue reaches its apotheosis in our friendships properly understood, as relationships in which we have mutual regard for the well-being and virtue of each other. And from this comes an account of community likewise ordered to virtue. This is our natural end, or telos, and ideally our lives will be integrated around the focal goal of achieving that telos. Now you might ask, okay, where does wealth fit into that? You talked about being this good, upstanding person, and not even upstanding, but a person who just exercises themselves well. Uh, in all aspects of their lives. Um, now, for Aquinas, wealth is unambiguously a good. He's not advocating we all go out in the desert in our hair shirts and renounce wealth. Um, he takes up the arguments of his day uh, when voluntary poverty was kind of a thing because of the Franciscans. And he argues that yes, it's actually perfectly fine to uh, renounce poverty, 
But he does not do that by despising the material wealth. The whole tenor of his argument is, no, material flourishing is a good thing, but sometimes it might be proper to renounce it for a higher good. But notice that says that the material wealth is a good thing in itself. Okay. Um, he would look around our well-ordered communities and find much to applaud in them. So, <clears throat> material wealth sustains life, yay. Uh, it allows us to pursue the higher ends, and above all, it's natural to us. God created a world that promises us abundance, and this is good. He said so in the first chapter of the book. However, as Thomas's discussion of voluntary poverty also makes clear, material wealth is essentially an instrumental good. So this is where the idea of ordering comes in. An instrumental good is something that's good because of what you want it for, not for itself. Okay, so I can love my brother for himself. That's the direct <coughs> good. To love something instrumental is to love it for the sake of something else. Okay, so wealth is not a good pure and simple. It is good insofar as we order it to or use it for good ends. Insofar as wealth leads us into vice, it's not a good at all. So notice the concept of ordering. Diverse goods like material wealth and virtue don't seem to be commensurate, how we trade them off, but they don't come into tension. There's a very simple question to ask. Is my pursuit of wealth ordered to pursuing these higher goods? Then yay. And if it takes me off that path, then not yay. Okay. So to return to my examples, the young lawyer would only choose the corporate law over a career of providing counsel to the poor if he judged that his work for the corporation and the virtuous pursuits that the high salary enabled was the best way for him to be an excellent person. The manufacturer could never legitimately sell shoddy goods for the sole purpose of pursuing private profits, but he could legitimately discern that the community was better served by an abundance of cheaper products than by a more limited quantity of high quality ones. Uh, you guys have seen me in Front Seasons? I hope. If not, we'll see it immediately and then come back to my line. Richard Rich simply cannot sell his soul, sell his soul for works. Okay, you can't, you can't prostitute yourself as a good, you can't sacrifice your virtue just to make a lot of money. Um, and, and we're so messed up on this. I have a lot of students at Villanova who are super well-meaning kids, and they're like, oh, I would love to go and be an elementary school teacher. I would feel really fulfilled by that. But it wouldn't be rational. It wouldn't be rational. Okay. Because they'd be not be making a lot of money. And I want to say, if the purpose of your life is to do the thing that's most fulfilling to you, the most rational thing you could do, of course, is to teach elementary school. Okay. So Aquinas calls us back, and you're all nodding. So this point is intuitive to us, but the, the world we live in kind of makes us feel like, oh, there's a trade-off. It's like, no, there's not a trade-off. It either helps you become a better person or it doesn't. Um, okay. A direct implication of this line of thought is that measures of economic productivity, like GDP, are not measures of actual value. Many of the goods and services we produce and consume are indeed well-ordered to good ends, to a life of virtue, uh, but many are not. To the extent that economic prosperity allows us to stay in life and increase our options to fully explore our capacities as human beings, that's a real and genuine good. Yay markets, yay capitalism. On the other hand, to the extent that it can distract us from the pursuits that would allow us to fully explore our capacities, it can be an evil. Uh, now, as it happens, economists are increasingly calling into question the usefulness of GDP as a measure of actual well-being. Um, there's a whole new field opening up on happiness economics, which is noticing that wealth does not generate a lot in the way of actual happiness. Now, they measure happiness differently than what Aquinas. I'm not going to go into that here. But there does seem to be a confluence, a, a, a movement, a convergence to the idea that if we really want to think intelligently about economic life, we need to think not just about how, we, how well we translate resources into wealth, but how well we translate wealth into human flourishing, into a good life. It's the most common sense argument in the world. Okay. So that's the first key point from Thomas's framework. Um, and as common sense as it is, it's a surprisingly powerful one. Economic life is not an end in itself. Okay. Now we're going to do some theology. Um, so as a theologian, Aquinas goes on to argue that human beings are oriented not towards a natural telos or end, but to a supernatural end as well. We are created in the image and likeness of God, which for Thomas means we are created for the purpose of knowing and loving God as God knows and loves himself. We will not fully realize his capacity this side of eternity, 
but as an understanding of human nature is ordered towards a loving union with God. Okay, now, I just did a quick move on you that you probably did not notice. Aquinas just gave you two ends. You have a supernatural end and a natural end. And I just spent the first part of this lecture saying that we should have our lives ordered to the one end of human excellence. We went from one end to two ends. Did you notice that? Um, okay. Uh, we need to figure out how these two ends are related to one another. Um, and I think this is at the root of a lot of our modern dilemmas. We don't know how to think about this. Uh, the, <clears throat> The question how to balance our sense that created good is genuinely good, excuse me. Um, yeah, the question how to balance our sense that created good is genuinely good, but that our ultimate destination is for an eternal good has been a difficult one in Christian thought. Okay, how do I relate the fact that I know my ultimate happiness is in the beatific vision in heaven with the fact that I also want to be happy in this life? Is life but a shadow that ultimately means nothing in light of the sweet hereafter? Our modern sensibilities tend to veer away from that thought on the perfectly sensible ground that creation here and now is a genuinely good good, and there's something faulty with the mode of thought that dismisses it as an illusion or a deception. Um, but if we simply focus on the temporal good that is present to us, it seems we must inevitably minimize the importance of God in our lives, lest God overwhelm our sense of the importance of the temporal good. You see my problem? If you have this enormous huge good in heaven, how do you think about these temporal finite goods in a way that makes us still value the temporal finite goods? <clears throat> okay. The secular impulse of modernity is closely connected to the elevation of the temporal good to a question of ultimate concern. That is what we've done for the last several hundred years. This sort of bracket, and this is even true of believers. God is something else, and then there's this life here and now, and we focus on that. Okay. Now Thomas's framework answers the question of how to balance the two ends by seeing the relationship between God and creation as an analogical relationship. I would love to take you through the theology on this because it's beautiful, um, but this we're going to do a shortcut. Uh, we're going to—it starts with the doctrine of creation ex nihilo that God created the world out of absolutely nothing. God alone is that which necessarily exists, and creation is a result of God's choice to share His goodness. Creation ex nihilo doesn't refer to a big bang sort of creation. Uh, it's rather the very beautiful notion that at every moment God is sustaining you in being, breath by breath, moment by moment. Okay. Um, our existence depends on God's active, ongoing, continuous choice to sustain us in being. Um, and more importantly, we're rooted in Him. Because God is the ultimate existence, all aspects of creation are not only sustained by Him, but rooted in Him. And by that I mean they reflect Him somehow. Because think about it, there's nothing apart from God for us to reflect. Any quality, any, any, anything that you see in this world or think of has to come from God because if you really create it out of nothing, there's nowhere else for it to come from. If that's the case, the good life we pursue in temporal terms, day by day, has to be a reflection of our ultimate end in God. Temporal human flourishing is a foretaste of the beatitude we will ultimately know. That solution allows us to say that human flourishing is a very real good. It's a reflection of God's goodness, the one that is directly accessible to us here and now. To renounce that goodness would be to renounce the author of it. Okay? At the same time, because we are made for that infinite beatitude, we're not to mistake the temporal goodness for our ultimate good. It's a real good, but it's only a foretaste. It's a pointer. And the analogy I like to use is, um, and this is a little bit dated, I'm a little bit dated now, um, it used to be if you went around the world to go study abroad or something, and you had a honey, and the honey was here and you were over there, uh, you waited, uh, trust me, you waited by the mailbox for the love letters to come, right? And you get your love letters, and you would cherish those love letters, okay? And you would cherish those love letters because they came from your honey, because they exuded, they point to your honey, right? But they're not. You would never mistake them for your lover, right? So the world is God's love letter to us. It's, it's a reminder of where we're to go, right? Um, but we would never ever mistake it for the thing we want. Okay. Now why does this matter? Um, there's two immediate consequences to this. Uh, and the first one is a practical one that surfaces all the time. It's a reminder that human flourishing in, a, in our direct, is our direct present access to something like the good we ultimately desire. That explains why suffering is so upsetting. If you see somebody who's suffering, who's poor, who's ill, 
they're deprived of that goodness, that flourishing that says something about God, right? So it's cutting them off of that source of goodness, and that's why we respond to it the way we do. So we're urgently called on to meet the needs of others, because that is a direct way to witness to God's goodness. If we did anything else, we'd be denying that God is good. Our neighbors like us are images of God, and we should urgently desire that they, like us, are able to know and love God as fully as a temporal creature might. And that's by flourishing now. That's as close as we can get. At the same time, if we remind ourselves that the ultimate good lies in God, it becomes possible to bear with patience the suffering we cannot divert. The latter is important because if we do not have that patience, the fact of overwhelming suffering can overpower us. It would seem to men that we give up everything of our own concern and pursue the alleviation of human ills, which are far larger than we can handle. Um, but since we can't do that, it's not, we're not wired to be able to do that, uh, many of us, at least, become tempted to give up on the project of helping all together. Uh, it's compassion fatigue, right? So if you go out and you want to help other people, but then you see there's so much to do, you give up. So the image here is very much of the guy um, with the starfish, right? So you show God's goodness by rescuing the starfish that have washed up on the ocean, as many as you can. But the fact that there's a whole beach, millions of them that you can never get to, is not a reason for you not to help the few that are, are available, right? Okay. It's a way that allows us to engage without being overwhelmed with despair. I find that very powerful. Okay, this is trickier. The analogical view also provides us a way of seeing the good of material wealth in a way that's not just as an instrument to our other ends. Um, so, as I've already discussed, the primary good of wealth is that it helps serve us in keeping our lives sustained and allow us to pursue the cultivation of the higher human goods. Um, but created goods also bear witness to God's goodness, and if we can appreciate their good as witness, it allows us to detach ourselves somewhat from our tendency to see them in terms of how they can serve us. That view can help steer us away from the view of the natural world as merely an instrument of human desire towards a view that has proper reverence for the goodness we find ourselves. Um, this, by the way, for those of you who've read Laudato Si, I think it really underlies a lot of what the Pope has to say. But the idea is simply that we've gotten so used to looking at things as potential consumer goods that we forget to see the message contained in them, the way they reflect God's own goodness. And because we don't see that, we're not arrested by it. And that's part of why the world doesn't fulfill us as, as fully as it otherwise might. Okay, if we reflect a little bit further on this point, how can the infinite goodness of God be reflected in a finite world? Um, we can come to a better understanding of the nature of the created good. First, as Thomas argues, one way that God reflects his infinite goodness in finite creatures is by letting each individual creature reflect one facet of his simple, supreme, superabundant goodness. And the analogy I like to use for this uh, is to think of God's goodness as a white light. So it's simple, right? but if you shoot that white light through the, the prism of creation, it scatters out into, into a rainbow of colors. Okay, so we go out and we see an apple and an orange, and the apple says something in its appleness about God that the orange and its oranges cannot. Okay, so each created qualitatively distinct thing speaks to God in its own unique way. Right? And that's the only, yeah, does that make sense to you guys? Okay, um, the world is made up of an astonishing array of diverse goods, and collectively they tell us something about God that no one good could possibly tell us. But that means you have to appreciate them in their distinctiveness. At the same time, God is still one. So we've got all these diverse, qualitatively distinct goods, but they're ordered to each other. The universe is shot through with relationship that makes of it a coherent whole. Okay. Um, Nature is a web of interconnections holding all these diverse goods into a meaningful whole that collectively gives the best witness to God's infinite goodness. Now, there are clearly lessons in all of this about the proper respect we should have for the environment as we pursue our economic affairs. I, I hope you can hear that. If I look out in the world and I see that each created thing, there are witnesses to God's beauty and goodness in a certain way, I have to respect it. And it also invites me to see it as a tangle of relationships, which means respect for the way things interact. Okay. And again, Laudato Si really, really brings this out. Um, in addition, it suggests an attitude towards our own relationship with created uh, goods, namely seeing them as a project and participating in God's creation by ordering goods that constitute our material life in a way that reflects the unity of our own lives. Now that's a mouthful. Okay, the aim is not just to get more stuff. 
The aim is to take a few of those beautiful diverse goods and order them well in a way that brings out their beauty and their harmony. Okay? So the, the, the image I like to use is that we should think about our choices in life as though we were painters. Right? How do we arrange a few select things well rather than try to you know, fill up a warehouse full of as much things as we can get? Okay. All right. So and I'm not going to be able to draw this out as much, but can you hear that part of the problem with economic language that saturates our culture is that we always want to think about how you can trade off goods against each other. I can buy my apples and oranges for a certain price. We treat everything as fungible. Right? And the more we see things as fungible, we're not seeing them in their particularity and we're missing their essential goodness. And that's part of why they don't quite satisfy us. Right? It's part of why we blaze right through them. Okay. So, we have the key ideas of seeing the economic life is properly ordered to our larger practical pursuit of excellence and giving witness to God's goodness and the idea that creation is an analogical reflection of God's goodness, which affords us a better appreciation of the goodness that's in creation. I think I used goodness five times in that sentence. Okay. All right. Uh, do I, and it's not usual during a talk. Does anybody have any major questions at this point? Order analogical reflection. Am I ready to roll? Okay, I want to try to bring it alive with my two and possibly three examples. Okay. Uh, number one, let's think about human desire a little bit. Um, for economics, that would be the demand for goods and services. An essential aspect of the modern economy is that it promises ever-rising standards of living. The notion of economic progress is so foundational that the easiest way to predict who will win the next election cycle is to look at whether the economy is growing or shrinking. A large portion of political rhetoric centers on promises to find ways to promote economic growth. And I beg you just to imagine me running for office saying, hey, by the way, I don't care whether the economy grows or not next year. Maybe it would be better if it didn't. Um, I would get two votes, maybe. Well, when my mom and dad passed away. Oh. <laughs> maybe my brother would vote for me. Um, did you say probably not? <laughs> okay. Uh, at the same time, there's a culture of unease with our materialism, right? So, it, at least in the last decade or two, there's movements for simplicity. We all know that we have too much stuff. We know that we're crammed full of it. We know that it hollows us out, makes us empty. And yet, at the same time, we would never vote for a politician who didn't promise us more stuff. Okay. Economists have long refused to distinguish between needs, wants, and desires, arguing that humans have infinite wants, and the task of markets is to meet those wants as much as our limited resources permit. And underlying that idea, if I have unlimited wants, then I always want more economic growth because they let me get more of what I want. Okay. Now, in some sense, Aquinas would agree that humans have a longing for the infinite. We just said we're built to love the infinite good that is God. Um, but when we're thinking about these finite goods, um, human nature is finite and therefore has finite needs. And therefore, when we think about material wealth, at any rate, if we're thinking about it rationally, um, we would only want to have a finite amount of them. Now, by that I don't mean a little amount of them. I mean a finite amount. So the key word I like to use is it's bounded, measurable, or satiable. Okay. Um, <clears throat> basically, depending on your station in life and the goods you're pursuing in your life, you should be able to have a well-articulated sense of how much you need, such that you could say, above that, everything else is superfluous. Everything else is like water. Okay. Um, most people think that number is about $10,000 more than what they currently have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and that's always just kind of $10,000 away. Now, Aquinas recognizes that humans can and do develop what he calls a disorder to concupiscent desire for more. That is, we, cannot, we all are tempted to the uh, temptation of thinking, just one more, just one more, just one more. At least to the sense that we can never quite have enough. He terms this artificial wealth and observes that the desire for artificial wealth is not curbed. There's nothing to curb it since by definition it is a desire for wealth that is not ordered to any definite end. Um, so when I talk to my students about their desires for material wealth, I've taught economics for 15 years, they all want to make a lot of money. My humanities students all want to make a lot of money. Okay. And I ask them why, and they usually don't have a good answer. It's not like they have a specific telos for that money. right? What they say is it's like a blank check. I want to have money available to handle whatever comes up. But what you should hear in that is that aimlessness. It's not ordered to anything. Okay. Um, so it's just a statement that they are definite and vague about the ends they're pursuing in life. 
Okay. Now, Thomas's argument is we can tell that this is a problem because when you get this stuff, it doesn't satisfy you. You buy the new house, it's 200 square feet bigger, and it's lovely for about six months. Right? And then it starts to get cramped. And then it's downright confining. And then you have to go get another house. Um, I've done that a few times. I, by the way, am conscious of my desires. So. Okay. Um, you guys all know that phenomenon. You get the new car, it's great, and then it wears off, and then you need another one. Okay, and just the very fact that it never satiates tells you it's not the good that you want. It tells you that you do not have a well-ordered relationship to you. Um, now, by contrast, the claim is if you ever got to God, you would rest in it, and you would just be so nourished and fulfilled in it, right, that, that there you would be. You can't just take these infinite desires for granted. Because the world is finite, we conclude this means that scarcity is an inescapable feature of human life. Uh, and by the way, they kind of rejoice in this secretly because economics is the science of allocating scarce means to. It's the science of scarcity. So as long as there's scarcity, they have jobs. Um, but we, we're pervaded with the sense of scarcity. That's what allows us to be the richest human, um, human beings who've ever lived, the richest society that has ever been seen, ever. And we don't think we have enough. It's the most, if you stop and think about it, it's an astonishing fact. Okay, the scarcity pervades our sense that life is a series of trade-offs. If I don't have enough, then if I want to get one thing, I have to give up another. Everything seems constrained. Um, and on Thomas's account, this need not be the case. Recall the lessons from the analogical nature of the temporal good. Our best access to the infinite good we are built for in this life is not from a random accumulation of finite goods. Rather, it would come from taking care to appreciate the good and the things we have to really look at them and see them and what they are, to order them well, to let that beauty of the arrangement reflect something in God, to feel nourished in that. Um, that's how God's good is reflected in this world. That's how we find fulfillment. There's no stairway to heaven. It's not found by pursuing an indefinite more. Okay? But there is the possibility of having the wisdom to appreciate the mirror of heaven we have here, above all, by appreciating the fittingness of its finitude to our finite natures. Okay. Now, if you had a world like that, if we could actually really find that point where we're satiated, think of all the problems that would really go away. Because we are in an abundant, we have an affluent society. If I know that where my point is where I have enough, all that rest flows out of me to help another person. And it's not a sacrifice. Right? It's not a sacrifice to give away money I don't need. Um, think about the environment. If we all collectively knew where our point of satiation was, we're not going to put that relentless pressure on the environment to grow. Um, almost everything that's difficult for us in our economic lives comes out of that disordered sense that we always need more. Okay. Um, now, if we were to take Thomas seriously, we would realize that an essential question for economics is not how best to fulfill our desires, but rather how best to train ourselves to desire what is genuinely good. The economic problem of scarcity cannot be combated solely by the main quest to expand our incomes, because there would never ever be sufficient resources to satisfy our concupiscent desires. The only way we can overcome scarcity is when we uh, discern when our desires are satiated. Okay. So we're always going to feel strapped until we get rid of this idea. Thomas's claims about the nature of human desire are out of step with economic theory. But like I said, I think his claims have purchase in the culture, judging from the fairly widespread suspicion or concern that we are overly preoccupied with material wealth. Um, and I think I'm only going to have time to do um, the other example. So I want to turn to the subject of property rights. This was the first one I encountered. This is the first one that just set my heart aflame with love for Aquinas. Um, so it turns out Thomas, unlike a lot of other Catholic theologians, is willing to affirm the goodness of private property, but he does so in a way that is very much at odds with the way we think about it in our culture. And I think it's illuminating. He inherited a tradition that largely taught that private property is tolerable, but only as a concession to sin. So if we were saints, if Adam and Eve had not eaten the darn apple, right, we wouldn't have private property. We'd be all communal. The early apostles tried to live a life in common. Um, the rest of us need to have private property because we're fallen. Against that tradition, Aquinas argues that private property is a part of natural law, which means that private property would be a valid institution even if we had not fallen. Huh. Okay, but the way he does that is instructive. So how does he do this? He says, look, let's think about private property in two different lights. There's two questions you can ask about private property. First, how do I use the private property? 
What are, what are the rules about how I spend it? How do I use it? And second, how do I manage it? How do I, how do I, how do I shepherd it? Um, now, with respect to that first aspect, how do I use it? He says, look, God gave the material world to humans in common, and the material world is, is meant to, order to, supporting human needs. Um, and since he thinks our own needs are finite or satiable, the real ones, the ones that are real, um, that means that anything we have above that properly belongs to others, right? In fact, it's such a strong obligation, you'd almost be stealing from the poor if you consume beyond what you actually need. Um, so, <clears throat> it's very much in line with Catholic social thought's frequent reminder that there's a common destiny of all goods. What you own is yours, but it also really belongs to other people as well. So the second aspect that he comes up with an argument that's more explicitly affirming than private property. Um, here he's thinking about the private property that you own and manage. And he says it's actually perfectly natural and legitimate and just. And he gives three reasons for this. I'm actually taking them backwards. But number one, if we did not assign private property, we'd be likely to quarrel about how to divide up the goods. We've seen this at any kid's birthday party. That's mine. No, no, that's mine. Okay. So if we didn't have private property, we would all be quabbling like that. And okay, this clearly is an argument for private property that says, yeah, it's a concession to human sin. We need to have private property because we're spoiled brats. Um, but the second reason is I'm going to quote from him: because human affairs are conducted in a more orderly fashion, and each man is charged with taking care of some particular thing himself. Whereas there would be confusion if everyone had to look after any one thing indeterminately. We need to have private property because if we were trying to live collectively, communistically, and we all walked out the door and we all owned everything together, we would have to decide what to do. I'd walk out my door and go, well, do I go to the strawberry field today or do I go take care of the oats? Should I milk the cows? You would be deciding something else. We'd be bumping into each other. It would be chaos. Okay. This insight that private property order, it just tells me my share of creation to take care of is that strawberry field over there, right? That's my domain, that's my responsibility. Then I know what to do when I get up, and each one of you would know the same thing as you would have your own sphere where you go out to work. Um, it's very resonant with the economic idea that's emerged after Aquinas that part of the source of economic productivity is when we can specialize. If I have one field that I cultivate, I know everything about that field. I know what fertilizers to go, when to water, all the rest. If you're specializing in your sphere of being a doctor, you know everything about your sphere, you become good at it. Okay. Private property allows that. It allows that specialization. Um, and notice that this would, uh, this would be a reason to have private property, whether we were sinners or saints. Okay, because all it's saying is that we're finite, right? Because I'm finite, I should have a finite domain over which I'm in charge. Okay. The third, and this is where the wrinkle is, he finally argues that private property is part of natural law because, quote, every man is more careful to procure what is for himself alone than that which is common to many or all, since each one would shirk the labor and leave to another that which concerns the community. Okay, when I first read that, as a person who's been in economics for all my adult life, I thought I was talking about incentives. Right? The only way to get people to go out and work hard is if you tell them they get to keep what they earn. That's how, that's how people work. Um, and then I hit a wall and I said, but wait a minute. He just told me on that other ground, when I come to using wealth, I have to be prepared to share it with other people. I should treat it as though it was in common. So my head exploded. This was a big, huge <laughs> meltdown that I had. Um, but I finally sorted it out. Um, first of all, it turns on that idea that I'm more careful to procure what is for myself when it comes to tending my own immediate needs. The rest is surplus or abundant and due for others. That's one way to cover it. But the other one is, I think it's analogous to the point I just made. If I'm thinking about things from a God's eye perspective, there's all this creation, right? Private property lets me go out and care for one sphere of it. But then when I'm, I'm thinking about who do I take care of with the proceeds from that, it's natural for me to first think of the part of the creation God has entrusted to me, which is me and then my family, and my neighbors, the things that are close to me. So it's actually very natural for us to want to work a little bit harder to take care of ourselves. It's built into human nature. Okay? Now, notice, this isn't an argument that I can be selfish at your expense. Right? It's seeing things in light of God. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to do this part just because it's beautiful. Um, you can, this, is re, this, is, this gets reflected in the way Thomas thinks about charity. He actually uh, sounds a little bit unchristian on this point. So charity is love. And because he's a good scholastic theologian, he takes up the question, what is the proper order of charity, by which he means we're commanded to love God, love our neighbors, and love ourselves, which comes first, right? What's the proper order? Uh, surprise, God comes first. You guys can figure that one out, right? Okay, so God wins hand down. He's the infinite good. We should all love God first, right? And, yeah. And if we really knew who God was, we would do so naturally, spontaneously. It wouldn't even be a sacrifice. It would be the easiest, most natural thing in the world. Okay, so now it's down. So for number two, is it us or is it our neighbor? And almost everybody would think that a Christian would say the neighbor comes first and then ourselves. No. Number two is me. I get to love me next and then my neighbor. Now there's a trick here. Why would Thomas say this, right? Okay. Because he's thinking about that first love. If I really love God first and foremost, if God is my everything, and I try to love my neighbor more than me, I'm bypassing the part of creation through which I get to access God. My experience of God comes through me. Is that, okay? If I try to love you more than me, I'm actually cutting God out of the picture. But notice that I'm not loving myself the way I ordinarily in my fallen state love myself. Like, whoa, I'm so cool, you're so not. Um, <laughs> it's me loving me for the sake of because this is my access to God. Do you feel, hear that different? Okay. And because I love myself for the sake of God, I love you because you're my fellows in loving God. Okay. And if I'm thinking about it that way, my order to command, the command to take care of myself first is just to say, take care of the part of creation that's immediately entrusted to me, but then also be cheering on as you take care of yourself and if you're having trouble to help you. Right? So it's a very beautiful, I think it's a very beautiful teaching. And, it, and notice how it gets at our insight or instinct, especially in the modern world. It's natural to care for yourself, but there's ways to do it that's wrong. Right? And it and allows us to articulate better how that goes. Okay. I'm just trying to see what else you need to hear from me before I move on. Um, the, um. Okay. Thomas's teachings allow us to value the economic insight that is natural for us to work for ourselves. Um, but Thomas challenges our understanding of that intuition in two ways. Okay. First, and this is just to repeat, just to make sure that you hear this. Um, Private property is good, it channels my natural interest to care of myself and all the rest of it. Uh, but in light of the fact that I understand that my needs are finite and satiable, and that the rest is due to others, right? So it's always a contained use there. Um, but second, the steadiness of private property, the goodness of private property, isn't because I did anything intrinsic. Notice that all the argument has been entirely in terms of what's useful. What's useful for me, what's useful for the community. There's never a moment in Aquinas where he says, oh, and by the way, I worked for it, it's mine. Okay, we get that from John Locke in the modern world. His idea is, I own myself. If I own myself and then I work with something, I'm mixing my labor and I naturally own that too. I built it. It's mine. Okay. Um, okay. So why does this matter? Notice that it shifts the focus. Private property is not about what's owed to us. It's about what we owe to ourselves and to others. It's about how do I cultivate the creation, how do I cultivate myself for the sake of others, for the sake of God. The good of owning property is that it allows us to exercise our productive capacities. It's an exercise that's part of our cultivation of our human excellence. Um, but our use of goods is bounded, okay? And we have that communal sense where I share with others. Okay. Um, so, it just seems to me, it gives us a way to navigate a lot of our modern um, confusions about these questions. If I understand private property in that way, um, I can see that it's really good and fitting and natural, and that underlies a lot of the economic insights into the way markets channel people towards more productive ends. Right? Um, and, and, and it also gives a strong argument about why central planning is, is not a good institution. Uh, but at the same time, it allows a critique. It says, but we view it in this overly possessive way. We view it as having an unlimited use. We can spend it however we want. It's too individualistic. right? So it kind of speaks to both sides of the issue. All right. Now we could ask whether Thomas thinking does not undermine the engine of self-interest that drives capitalism, which has lifted billions out of poverty. This is the issue that keeps me up. If Aquinas is really right, and if Europe had 
because Europe is where this all started. If Europe had kept that idea, the question is, would we have modern day wealth? Would we have achieved what we achieved? And yeah, I think the answer is probably no. Okay. How did we get capitalism? Partly because we adopted the idea that yes, you can go for more. You can have an unlimited quest for more. And that greed or ambition drove people um, to produce more. I'm going to stop producing that. So, um, so the question is, does Bill Gates have to have incentive to build Microsoft if there's a social climate that would tolerate that he had only a mansion of 6,000 square feet rather than 66,000? Right? Do we need a culture that says you can have as much as you want and that's what motivates you to go out and do great things? Um, at the end of our day, how much of our economic progress depends on a system that tolerates and even encourages the pursuit of artificial wealth in the quest to satisfy it? At the end of the day, how much of our economic progress depends on a system that tolerates and even encourages the pursuit of artificial wealth and the quest to satisfy concupiscent wealth, desire? It's hard for me to answer that, but I do want to point out a few things. So people are worried that if, if we got rid of all this greed and ambition, we wouldn't have as much stuff, right? And that therefore a lot of people would still be poor and it would all be very bad for us. Um, but I do want you to notice that there's a lot of places where people are motivated, motivated to work very hard by things other than money. Academics is a case in point. Academics do not make a lot of money. They tend to work very hard, and they do so for reputation. Right? I want you to like the work I'm doing, so I work hard on it. Right? That's how we do it. Um, in, in an interesting book on the Industrial Revolution by Joel Moker, it turns out a lot of people who uh, discovered the inventions that did so much to increase productivity, they did so also for reputation effects. They wanted to write articles in their journals to their fellow guys. They didn't actually make a lot of money from it. And more importantly, you actually all know a lot of people who get up out of bed and work very hard at occupations they believe in simply because they think it's a good thing to do. I have in mind teachers and nurses and firefighters. Okay. So greed is a motivator, it's true, but it's not the only one, right? Okay. I'm sorry. I have a great talk that goes on for another half an hour, but <laughs> I'm gonna wrap it up. Okay. You get my last beautiful paragraph from then. This in some is Thomas's message. It really is quite simple. Property rights and markets are meant to be in service of our economic activity, which in turn is meant to be in service of genuine human flourishing. When they perform their proper roles, they are well suited to human nature and to facilitate meaningful economic progress. The institution of markets is congruent with the profound fact that we are created as finite beings. It allows us to specialize in the areas of our particular expertise and then share the fruits of our labors with others. Through the market, we can achieve a more thoroughgoing and profitable economic coordination than would be possible through central planning, an economic model that is not congruent with human finitude. However, when we forget the instrumental nature of property rights, money and wealth, um, the economic system gets distorted. The ability of markets to be manipulated for the sole purpose of making money as opposed to creating true wealth resonates with the human temptation to forget that our material wants are finite and to seek to fulfill our insatiable concupiscent desires. As we succumb to that desire, a gap emerges between economic logic and moral realities. As the economy distorts, it becomes less efficient in the fullest meaning of the term. It may seem to excel at converting resources into income, but when we ask how much genuine human good we extract from that income, the distorted economy would seem to be far less efficient as it might appear. I've already said I will offer you no policy prescriptions, but I can leave you with this concluding observation. We have the capacity as human beings to learn how to value what is genuinely of value, but this is not something that can be legislated. It is the culture that for some time now has chosen to value the pursuit of wealth, irrespective of whether that wealth is used wisely, and to treat monetary measures like income and wealth as being more real than the true values they are meant to represent. So long as that persists, it seems likely that we will have to accept that the benefits of capitalism come along with the downsides of instability and inequity and environmental degradation. But cultures can and do sometimes shift. And so I hold out to you Thomas' vision of a humane economy as a cultural possibility well worth considering. Thank you.